it's not like AI is replacing developer writing code. It's like they can build software a lot faster, right? Why? Because they just have to focus on like building systems and not writing hundreds lines of code because now they can just delegate that to AI. That shift from writing code to designing systems mirrors what's happening across every growth team today. Welcome back to Rewiring Growth. Today, I'm joined by Sylvain Giuliani, who leads growth at Augment Code. And we talk about how AI is transforming the way we build and scale companies, not by replacing people, but by letting them focus on high leverage work. This show is brought to you by Apollo.io, the end-to-end AI sales platform built to help modern sales teams grow. I started my conversation with Syl by asking, how do you prioritize and stay focused when the scope of growth is so expansive? What is growth but like just another version of marketing? The way I think about growth is like this traditional marketing that is very uh, campaign and uh, program based. And so by that, there's always kind of like an expiration date, right? Growth on the other side is like you are building systems, right? And so what does the gro- best growth looks like is you build a system that allows you to go on holidays and still print money. I think the first thing to do is like when you do nothing is to learn, right? And so when I joined Augment Co, I knew that the customer journey was going to be different because of the AI market and like the appetite for the market. What's the traditional conversion rate, sign up conversion rate? I know about the conversion rate, but I didn't know what about Augment. And so step one for me was build a system that can track a user from outside of our website acquisition all the way to the first payment through credit card, right? And then, you know, put enough user through this kind of like journey and then understanding classic system, you know, how, what is our sign up conversion rate? Why is it this way? Is it good? Is it bad? That's kind of like step one is like, establishing this baseline, right? And then the second is how to prioritize is like V1 of everything is never great. You can be like, well, this is not that great, you know, but this is good. So for example, that augment, you know, activation rate is fantastic, right? And so it was not like a, because people have know how to use AI, AI and agent in general. So there was not a lot of education that needs to be done. So that means we don't have to do a lot of like product education, lifecycle marketing, because it's very sticky. And so for us, like the biggest thing that I was focusing on is how do we make sure people, uh, you know, get to payment and how once they pay like how can they have the kind of starting to refer right so it's like a team base and so it's like you know how do we get met we start using it build confidence to use it enough to be able to invite sale because you know maybe matt cost me x amount of dollars to acquire but it's it's less less expensive to acquire sale for free via matt invite right and so that's a big focus of, of myself right now it's like how do we drive like team expansion right the second thing is like well you know, I looked at the journey. I was like, this is not that bad. And so I was like, well, how do we get more users? What are the growth loop at the top? How do we impl- amplify like word of mouth? How do we build programs? How do we build systems uh, to acquire more users? And then same thing is like, you know, one of the big things as you build those journeys, trend is inevitable, especially in a very uh, fickle market like AI, right? You get hit by churn and you, you have to understand is, is it you? Is it the market? Is it the users? I'll give you an example. Learning churn for us was like, oh, we we underestimate how much um, revenue we will get from like for example from APAC right so we invested tremendously in our payment system there right and so one of the biggest reason of churn was like billing issues from APAC when you see the data you're like oh let's add more payment method right and so that's kind of like easy to to diagnose and solve but like if even this there's like you're starting to get like price sensitivity analysis is like oh is the behavior of a user in APAC is different than North America. And so straight away, you're getting to those kind of like small micro optimization. I think that's kind of like the dangerous when you have so much surface. Sure, I could optimize for like revenue from APAC, but maybe I should focus my time on just more user or, you know, more activation or, you know, whatever of a, a part of the journey. Right? Definitely. Yeah, there's there's like lots of different weights in, in growth funnels. I think, you know, you can, you can speed them up, right? Like, how do I get more people into it? There is like, how do I change the conversion rate? There's, you know, tons of different pieces in there. I know in the past with Census, one of the things we'd worked with you all on at Apollo was basically migrating from, you know, a different data vendor over to us. I think that's part of the growth ecosystem as well that I know is a counterbalance of, you know, people obviously ask, well, like, what is causing churn or what is causing uh, this under conversion? And a big part of that is just data, uh, you know, data about the type of persona. I think what I love about a product like, you know, Augment Code, for example, is it, it's got a, you know, type of a type of profile that might exist on like an Apollo pretty pretty prevalently, but there are often a lot of people that are doing like B2C uh, for consumer marketing. And that data is a little bit different to reach. It's consumer data and there's, there's not as big of robust databases like an Apollo typically on consumer. Uh, so, you know, when you think about the growth category holistically, 
I think we have somewhat of an easier job than we do B2B. There's a lot richer data sources. Uh, I feel very lucky. I'm sure you do too. Maybe that's why you've chosen B2B companies. Uh, how, how, how do you think about you know, that, that, type, that same type of challenge of data acquisition for the purposes of informing your growth data, especially for businesses maybe where it's like there's not a great data repo? Like how do you, how do you attack that? I can't remember on top of my head, the uh, enrichment rate at sensors was like 60, 70 percent enrichment rate. Most of the, what we couldn't enrich was APAC people like, you know, company that are not on LinkedIn or the Western internet or company that were too small to be on any data set. Right. So you never get a hundred percent, but like, you know, you get very high level of confidence. Right. But here to your point, it's like, you know, we, we are closer to like a B2C or direct to consumer uh, business. Our enrichment rate right now is like low 10 digits. So I think it's like 11%, right? The reason for that is the amount of obviously like free mail, right? Because we want as many users and they, they pay like, you know, there's not differentiation of payment between like free mail user on Gmail, Hotmail compared to a business email, right? But the thing that is interesting is like that itself is a very strong signal, right? Because if like, if you sign up to augment with your Apollo email address, well, obviously we can enrich for you uh, like, you know, 100% accuracy, basically, right? It shows a higher strength, like a signal of intent, right? Because if you're signing up with your business email, it's because you want to use it on your business settings and someone somewhere is going to get a corporate credit card, right? So it's almost like, a, like at first glance, I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do with this enrichment? I think it's just a different ball game. Is 11% the best? No, we barely started like our enrichment journey. So I'm sure we can increase it, but like we'll never get it to the B2B level of like, you know, beautiful data set that everything is always enriched, right? That's okay. But like, it does make you think about other ways to uh, understand your data. And it's not just about, I would say, demographic, firmographic signal, but it's a lot, a lot of like your first party data is like a very great source of enrichment and understanding your users. Too. Yeah. I have to imagine like the challenge for you all is exactly what you're saying. You, you, you use what you have, right? And so you do have a lot of powerful signal, you know, were they a Gmail or a Hotmail or an AOL or whatever, there, there's something there, right? You also have, you know, maybe source traffic, where did they maybe originate from? So maybe, you know, you go deeper on, you know, redirects or how they got to you, cooking, tracking, those types of things. But I think the other one that's really interesting is also probably a lot of onus on how do they actually use your product? You know, like what are those success loops early on in their life cycle? And probably you have to index a lot heavier on that, given that you have, you know, a lower data footprint on the front end for enrichment purposes. So uh, how does that compare to like sort of the, you know, the journey you've seen in other companies? I, I did not know actually y'all, y'all's enrichment rates were were in, in the percentages you're hovering on. But that's a unique challenge, I think, for a growth leader in particular. Do you see like AI helping with this? Not really. You know, how, how do you how do you think about that? For me, it's like the progressive profiling, you know, that we are forced to do. And so it's like, oh, you know, this person called like, you know, copy pasta is joining us, copy pasta at Gmail. It's like, obviously impossible to enrich this email. Uh, and then it's like, well, but then it's like, oh, copy pasta. And then for this, for this uh, surface, like maybe the community, you know, it's like, oh, still G, you know, it's like still G at, attending the event in san francisco how do we build this kind of like profiling we have not implemented this thing but like this is definitely where we need to be going to understand the shape of our user the benefit right is like our user base is so large and growing so fast that even 11 percent is a good representation of the size of our user base for our business that's also like the blessing is like there's enough user the the curse is like there's so much data you know to sift through it's not like the traditional b2b or it's like you know your your time is like couple of thousands of companies you kind of like can almost load them all up in your head you know it's like you in apollo you have all those pre pre-made filters and the whole company can use them depending on the season you, you have different target lists for us it's like how many engineers do you have you know this is like a very interesting way for us to use different way we're using apollo right it's like oh technographic is this signal on the market for us it's like how many software engineers do they have like, you know, like how many of them do we already have? What's the white space revenue? And then the question is, is it an automated the growth is in charge of growing the, te- the size of that team to a certain threshold? Or do we route out to sales and the sales go like, you know, expand the, the account, right? You know, people are talking about like signals on the market. And it's not, like for us, it's almost back to basic in this way. Cause it's like, if we know you work at it, like problem number one is like, where do you work? If we know where you work, then we know how many engineers. If we know how many engineers, we know how much revenue potential it is. And then we have enough product data or like, you know, trend of, of like the team using it to be like, oh, they're getting to the point where like they are very confident to, um, 
go to bat for augment internally and be champion, right? Oh no, it's so it's so it's so complex. Like I actually I, I empathize. I'm very close on our growth ecosystem internally, so I, I totally understand what you're saying. I think yeah, everything you're talking about really resonates with me. It's like that delta between the white space of how many people do they have versus what could they have theoretically. But then there's also harder question: What does it really mean to win an account? Are you winning a division, a team? What if it's just an individual that's using it because they're keen and there's no actual appetite internally? When's the right time to call it product? You know, product qualified. When should you act, generate a PQL for your sales teams? So they don't end up talking to one engineer that's just happily using it on their own versus the whole team's ready to buy. I think it's it's all of these things. I think the heart of what you hit at in that conversation is really this need for like a probabilistic model, even in terms of before that, like what's the probability or or what should we be doing? Do you, do you think that's something that you all will develop in house, or do you think there's actually an emerging player in the space that can help PLG companies do this? Like I I don't know how you're thinking about it. I, I struggle to find a great vendor for this. You know, today I, I tend to think we might have to build this, and it's unique to every business. But how how are you all thinking, or, or even just broadly, how do you think about that as a growth leader? Where those probabilistic models should live, or who should build and maintain them? Yeah, I think it's like you know, crawl walk run type of scenario. Like you know, I mean, even when I advise companies, it was like. What are your gut telling you that looks like? Build a simple point based system, right? Because that is like very easy to implement. It's very naive, but like, again, it creates this baseline of like, hey, we thought that this were the benchmark. And, you know, you can do a bunch of like, depending on your data, like doing a bit of regression analysis, things that have to be like, this is what like a good customer looked like. They do these things. And so we're going to wait. Like, you know, we think, we think people who use this feature are worth more we score them a bit higher, right? Like we weight them a bit. And that's usually a good place to start. I think quickly, and if you want to do that, there's a bunch of tools that exist. You know, it's like not, not, not difficult. As soon as you graduate out of that, it's basically you're starting to do complicated things or it's like going to be like, you know, constant like machine learning, regression, it's this best user. But what does best user means is going to be 10 version of best users, right? It's like, you know, think about Augment, like, what is the best user for us in Asia versus North America? What is the best user that has a high propensity of work, be a champion in a team versus the best user that is just a freelancer that works Augment, but they can pay, go from paying 50 bucks a month to 500 bucks a month. So that's already, you're saying you have like lots of complexity there or like definite, defining best user within their own cluster and segment. And then I think this is kind of like where once you go down, it's like, so this is something we did at Census that works really, really well. We basically just give it all to your AI, right? So it's like, you think about it, it's like we had all those usage data of the trend. And so we could say, hey, this is the Apollo account. You know, this is all the data we know about Apollo, how they use us. They use those things. That's the name of their model. This is the volume of the data. This is everything that the Apollo is doing with our marketing materials, going on our website, doing to our webinar, you know, all that stuff, right? And then we were running like regression analysis of our best customer on a weekly basis. And then we feed this, again, extra context to the AI to be, and this is what best customers look like, right? And then based on all of that, we're like, do you score them as a good customers and are they propensity to buy, right? And then it was very, very good. Like, you know, and then the great thing is like, you have all that context and it can straight away do like better scoring, better summaries for your sales team. And so the sales team is like, wow, this Apple account, like it seems to be doing really well and it looks similar to this other account that we have. And so maybe we can run and then guess what AI is really good at? That's a matching, right? So as soon as you get this, it's like, well, what's the next best offer, right? And so it's like, well... This company Apollo is doing research on like growth scoring model. And we have this webinar about this growth model. So you should reach out to this guy called Matt and talk to him about this video that we have on growth model. Right. And it's like, as a salesperson, you're really much like, okay, the research has been done for me. I just need to go and execute. And this is kind of like, you know, where the scales really comes in, you know, going from a scoring based system to this system. You're the very first person to mention this to me. That is like such a good insight, honestly. I, I I understand exactly what you're saying. Like the old world, let's talk about like three, four years ago. If you're the growth leader, it's you're like going to the sales team and like, why should I call this person? You're like, I don't know, dude. They like they they hit these signals, they did this thing, they downloaded this, there's three people on the team using it. They are just like high intent, but it's like I, I there's no pragmatic way to explain coherently to a team why they're qualified. It's just we know statistically they are and this model, it's not that com- it's not that it's that complex, but it it's a it's a bunch of signals scored together. I, I love where you're going there, which is like, you know, you almost think there's like a great use case for AI even of taking that growth signaling and then compiling it to what is the story of why you should be talking to this person in aggregate. That's like a really unique, it's the first time I've ever heard anybody sort of mention that. So I think it's a really, 
like really good applications. This kind of thing, right? Like depending on the business for us at Census, you know, we used to use Apollo heavily. And so we use like job data, for example, right? Because job data, as everybody knows, is like a mine of information, right? But like by itself, it's kind of like, hey, Matt, you're hiring a growth leader and we're a great tool for new growth leader. You know, it's like kind of like the worst pitch in your world, right? But if I say, hey, you are hiring a lot, especially this role where you said the mission is this, you know, it's like to revamp the growth function at Apollo. And then I take my first party data and I'm like, hey, you've been looking a lot of like PLG scoring, like, you know, you consume this honeypot content, as I call it, as a strong signals, right? And then maybe maybe we talked to you in the past, there was a previous opportunity with some close loss nut, you know? Like, honestly, you feed that to an AI and the AI is very, very good at like coming out of something that is, again, I'm not saying we're going to write the email because I think that's like so overblown nowadays, right? It even just informs the team member what they're about to go talk with the person about in the history and it's concise and th- synthesized. I think you're right. Less like, yes, you could theoretically generate an email from it, but that's the easy path. That's right. I, I, yeah, it's the hard part is how to have the conversation and contextualize it and use that history. Yeah, so I think that's like a very interesting part. You know, I think the, um, what I was going to say is like the other very interesting thing for me of AI is that I really believe is making everybody better, right? Because if you think about what we just discussed, we have the data. I can show you, you know, match you my AE you're going to like to Salesforce. I build you the best Salesforce in the world. And all of that data is going to be at, at your fingertip. Two things are going to happen. One, it's going to be overwhelming to you. So you're never going to use it. A big problem. Number two is I'm going to give you this nice information package. The data is available and you're curious. You're going to go and dig. And, you know, each time it's going to take you an hour to figure this pattern matching. And, you know, what you're going to see might be different than what Bob and Lisa are seeing. There's no consistency in a way. It's just going to take you a lot of time, right? Compared to AI powered, this this process with AI, right? You wake up every morning, you have 20, 50 accounts fully researched, right? Waiting for you in the inbox. And your job now is just to, you know, throw those balls away and be like, yeah, this is a good one. I know how to run this play. I have more context there and I can run it. And so suddenly instead of being like, 50 ready to engage account, if you think about it this way, spread across five ref because it's like 10 each, right? Now it's like one rep can do 50, right? Because a lot of the work doesn't have to be done for you. You still have to take the decision. That's the power of AI. This is what we see at Augment Code, to be honest. It's not like AI is replacing developer writing code. They can build software a lot faster, right? Why? Because they just have to focus on like building systems and not writing hundreds line of code, because now they can just delegate that to AI, right? But it's similar of like making people a lot more efficient. Yes, that's a good thing. I somewhat similar. I, I think I tend to believe two things with AI. One is it's going to be augment versus replace, at least in the first several years of it. And I think that's a lot of it. And then the second is like consolidation and simplification. I think that's the heart of what you're hitting on is how do you distill what's seemingly very complex into like very actionable in, in one pane, one surface that someone can interact with instead of going to find, you know, 20 different systems to find the, su- the summary. Uh, and I think the second one is absolutely true. It's like, augmentation here's here's all the work ready to go for you but still you have to go execute and do do your role really well um i know we're coming up on time what i'd love for you is just quick you know quick i've never heard of augment code before i'm hearing this for the first time you know why should i come check it out why should i go inter inter seals uh growth funnel like tell me about you know who should come find your product? Why? What's what the core value prop is here? If I'm listening for the first time, yeah, for sure. So, Augment Code is an AI coding assistant. We work in VS Code, Jet, JetBrain. You know, it's mostly aimed at developer or people who code. Really, uh, the thing that makes us unique is basically context, right? So, we have a property uh, technology that is really good at like uh, code retrieval. Why does that matter? Is like you know, if you take any of a code assistant on the market, you put us side by side. You know, uh, same prompt, same code base. What's going to happen? Both of them are going to be successful, like, you know, going to get to the outcome. Outburn's going to do it in like maybe one message or maybe one message plus free steering, like messaging, right? Compared to uh, the alternative is going to get there in like seven, eight, right? We get you high quality and to the right outcome faster than like, you know, over AI code assistant. Thanks for coming on, Seal. Thanks for the quick conversation. I feel like we could talk for like hours about this. So uh, enjoy, enjoy the time together. No worries. Thanks, Matt. And that concludes this week's episode of Rewiring Growth. My challenge for you this week is to take a hard look at one of your go-to-market motions and ask, is this a one-off campaign or a scalable, repeatable system? The best growth teams don't just run programs. They build engines. Huge thanks to Syl. And you can connect with him on LinkedIn or go check out what the team is doing at Augment Code. Otherwise, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll catch you later. 